My castaway this week is a songwriter. He was born into a poor Jewish family in the East End of London, left school at 15 and found himself drawn, thanks to an apprenticeship on the New Musical Express, into the world of popular music. He's known failure. He was a disastrously unsuccessful comedian at one time, but his unerring ability to write words that stay with you has made him a wealthy man. If you've seen or listened to the musical Sunset Boulevard, Aspects of Love or Billy, or heard the songs Born Free and Diamonds Are Forever and many, many more, then you're already familiar with his work. He's one of this country's most successful lyricists. He is Don Black. It seems to me one of the most frustrating things, Don, about being a lyricist is that if you do the job well, that is to say you get the lyric right, it's simple, it's concise, it just feels right, then everybody thinks, well, I could have written that, it's easy. They do. Uh, people find it very easy to criticise lyrics. Um, very few people can say, I hate that B-flat in bar 14, because that's very technical. But is it like writing a, a, a pop song? I mean, I often think when you hear a pop song that's destined to go to number one, you sort of know it, or I used to, I don't know whether I do these days, but you, you know it when you hear it, it sounds right. And it's the same with lyrics, isn't it? It's, there's a kind of obviousness about it. Uh, well, it depends what kind of lyrics you're talking about. If you're talking about lyrics in the old days or lyrics today, it's not so much about songs these days, it's more about records. I'm not what sure... What do you it, mean when you say that? Well... When I started writing songs, everyone, when I was in Denmark Street in the early days, people used to say, have you heard that great new Sinatra song? But these days they say, have you heard that great George Michael record? It's a big difference. When I started writing songs, they were demonstrated with a voice and piano, so you could really dissect it. These days, if you hear a demonstration of a new song... It's like the finished record with all kinds of sounds and synthesizers. So are you also saying that the words don't matter so much anymore? Well, they don't matter so much. No, I hate to say that, but um, I must say it, the words do not matter as much. Every now and again a song comes through, like a ballad in today's world, and people say, oh, good music's coming back. Because you get a song like The Wind Beneath My Wings or... Whitney Houston singing I Will Always Love You and people say have you heard that song that's one of the few times they say have you heard that song these days I very rarely listen to the radio and say what a fabulous song it's a shame but it's true but do you still feel you can sit down and write a fabulous song like Born Free or Diamonds well, Forever if that's what you care to do well I think times have changed I mean to give you an example you mentioned Born Free when I won the Academy Award for that in 1967 within a year or so 600 people recorded it now, Tim Rice, who recently won an Oscar for his song from Aladdin, I don't think anyone's recorded it, apart from the original people. Why not? Because there aren't those people making records. People who record today are people who sing their own songs, which uh, the Beatles have a lot to answer for that. I don't want to sound too... Uh, I'm not bitter about this, but it's just, it's just a fact that... It's just the way it is. It is. The, that's the way it is. Sue. More of that in a minute. Let's get you to this desert island. Um, tell me about your first record. Well, my first record is a song called Surrey with the Fringe on Top from Oklahoma, and it's just lyric writing at its best. It's Oscar Hammerstein doing what you're supposed to do. Every word hugs the contours of the melody, it crackles, it fizzes, and Lena Horne doesn't miss a syllable. Chicks and ducks and geese, little scurry When I take you out in the Surrey When I take you out in the Surrey fringe on top watch that fringe see how it flutters when i drive them high stepping strutters nosy pokes will peep through the shutters and the eyes will pop the wheels are yellow the upholsters brown the dashboard's genuine leather with eyes and glass curtains we can roll right down In case there's a change in the weather Two bright side lights winking and blinking Ain't no finer rig I'm a thinking You can keep your rig if you're thinking it I'd care to swap for that shiny little surrey with the fringe on the top 
Lena Horne and the Surrey with the Fringe on top from Rogers and Hammerstein's Oklahoma. The other great line there, of course, was the corn is as high as an elephant's eye and it looks like it's climbing right up oh, yeah. to the sky. He was just so full of imagery, Oscar Hammerstein. But it? that's what you have to do, isn't it? You have to just find that image that is, again, as I was saying earlier, very obvious and yet. And yet, yes, it's sort of saying what people think but can't say. I mean, that's, you look for that. You look for that fresh line. I'm always on red alert, you know, when I, I'm with people, when I'm with nieces, sisters, anyone, who, especially anyone who's got a, a troubled relationship. You, you, I hate to say this, but I like to hear them pour their heart out a little bit because they may just say a phrase. Come out with an original phrase. Come with, yeah. I mean, if I was in a restaurant and I heard someone at the next table say to someone else, you've lost that loving feeling, I, I'd write it down. <laughs> <laughs> but someone might have written it down before. That's right. <laughs> How often does it happen then? How often do you come across them? Well, you don't really, but you come up, come up with an idea. You know, someone, it's like when I wrote Tell Me on a Sunday, um, you know, it was a friend of mine was going through a bad time, a, a niece of mine, actually, and she was saying, I know it's not, not going to happen, you know, one day it's going to end. I just hope he does it right. And I thought, hang on a minute, how does she hope it's done? She wants to be taken to a park covered with trees and be told on a Sunday, please. I thought, mm. well, yeah, well, that's, that, I haven't heard that before in another song. There's that other very good line in that song, wasn't there? That don't call me at 3 a.m. from a friend's apartment. That's right. You know, it just kind of it's, sums it all up in a yes. way. Yes. I, I love songs that start you off straight away with the opening line. There's one coming up later on, which is a Kenny Rogers song, which he just says, in a bar in Toledo. Uh, you don't have to go any further than that. You're there in that bar in Toledo. It's so just, you like telling a story? Yes, like and particularly straight off in... in uh, it's like by the time I get to Phoenix, you think, oh, hang on, you don't have to say much more than that, you know. <laughs> you know be, somebody's She'll be on rising, a... yes, you know. Yes, yes. Uh, and then you're there, you're just in there, you've got that slice of life instantly. By the time I get to Phoenix, she'll be rising. She'll find the note I left hanging on her door. She laugh when she reads the part that says I'm leaving Cause I've left that girl so many times before By the time I make Albuquerque she'll be working She'll probably stop at lunch and give me a call. But she'll just hear that phone keep on ringing off the wall. That's all. By the time I make Oklahoma, she'll be sleeping. She'll turn softly and call my name out low. And she'll cry just to think I'd really leave her. Time and time I've tried to tell her so She just didn't know I would really go Now, that's for, for one-off songs. Mm. What about for musicals, though? If, you're, if you sit down with Andrew Lloyd Webber to write Sunset Boulevard, how do you begin? Well, you pray a lot. <laughs> but uh, well, with Andrew Lloyd Webber, he is a very much a musical dramatist. He is not like any other songwriter I've worked with, really. The thing about Andrew, he, he does write a lot before the song begins. Like a Norma Desmond on Sunset Boulevard, he will start playing the piano 
and she's on top of the stairs. And you'll say, Norma's on the stairs now, and he's playing. And she looks around to Joe Gillis, and now he's playing. Now he changes key, and he kind of shoehorns you into the song. Then he'll play with one look, or la, la, la. <laughs> so he says, he then gives you the gist of it. Yeah, we talk about it. He's very, you know, he's very good at that. He, he gives all the highs and lows, you think, well... But when you when you originally talked about it, you actually had memory in there, didn't you? I mean, the, the, that's the, right. The one that went on to be a big hit in Cats. In Cats, well, yes. you lost that. I did lose that. It just shows you. <laughs> and why, why did that happen? Because it was at a time. This was in about 1979 when uh, we started it, and we wrote this song for Norma Desmond called "A Big Star." It was called, or "The Greatest Star of All." And uh, then he went off Sunset Boulevard, went on to do Cats, but he didn't want to waste that marvelous melody. And he was right, wasn't he? <laughs> Midnight, not a sound from the pavement. Has the moon lost her memory? She is smiling alone in the land. Record number two. Well, record number two, I thought on this island I should keep myself busy with uh, writing lyrics, so I thought I'd choose one instrumental so I could keep writing words to my heart's content. And I just thought it's a wonderful melody, it's Albanone's Adagio in G minor. Terribly sad, I'm Not afraid. Not really, Thomas. Sue. I, I was scribbling some words or thinking of some words while it was playing. At, I'm talking with Sue Lawley. She's prettier than Sheridan Morley. <laughs> that wouldn't uh, keep you interested, <laughs> in that, would it? <laughs> no, it is full of sorrow and full of pain. That melody is just, uh, it's just so full of goosebumps. And uh, no, I can see myself under some kind of tree, pondering that. Mm. Tell me about your early life, because apparently you were born of a, a star-struck mother. Um, whose ambition was to be a cinema usherette, is that right? It was close. I mean, it was, uh, yes, um, we were very poor. We came from Hackney and uh, happy, all happy, happy. I know it isn't fashionable to talk about happy childhoods particularly, but mine was bliss and uh, my mother was uh, singing all the time. Um, they both came from Russia, my mother and father, and they just used to sing gypsy songs, flamenco songs, anything with a kind of a Jewish passion. Passion is probably the word I'm looking for. And um, so when Frankie Lane came on uh, the scene with things like Jezebel and Cry of the Wild Goose, my mother was just over the moon. And her idea of heaven was going to the Hackney Empire. <laughs> 
as, as often as she could afford it and taking me. And it was in Aladdin's cave. And she kept saying, E. Donald, because she came from Sunderland. She went from Russia to that. And she would say, E. Donald, look at those chandeliers. Look at the red plush carpets. And E. Look at him in a dinner suit. And it was just unbelievable. And it was the same with the Regal Cinema. We would go to see the Jolson story. And I was immediately taken with all this glamour. I mean, I suppose it's escape, really, but I didn't look on it as escape. And all these songs that had names, American names in them, like California, Here I Come, I Left My Heart in Avalon, Nothing Could Be Finer Than To Be In Carolina, Swanee, and here I was in Well Street, Hackney, you know. So it struck something in you even oh, then, Oh, it was it? just, and even the songs of the time, you know, you heard things like Moonlight in Vermont, and you thought, what is this world of all... Vermont and, and Swanee River. And uh, but you knew you wanted to be part of it? Well, I just I just fell in love with it. And uh, I saw that, the Jolson story, 32 times. <laughs> we all did, all our family did. And um, nearby there was a, a well-known singer of the day called Steve Conway. Some of your listeners may know he had a very big hit called Good Luck, Good Health, God Bless You. And every time he walked past the street, my mother would say, hey, don't know Steve Conway, look, he's got a camel coat on. <laughs> no, because <laughs> it was sort of, obviously, wealth uh, was something I'd, uh, we had no part of. What about at school? Were you, were you already a wordsmith? Did you enjoy all of that? Um, no, I remember my earliest recollection about words, but, but really it was to do with songs. I remember listening to the radio and listening to that marvellous... Larry Hart lyric, which is Ten Cents of Dance. And there's a wonderful internal rhyme in there. And sometimes I feel I've found my hero, but it's a queer romance. <laughs> and it's a marvellous, clever... And I thought, well, what's that? You know, and, and certain songs at the time was Cry Me a River, Told Me Love Was Too Plebeian, Told Me You Were Through With Me and Now You Say You Love Me. And I used to say, what does plebeian mean? And in Noel Coward's song, Mad About the Boy, this odd diversity of misery and joy, I'd rush to the dictionary, what does diversity mean? And at school I would go to my English teacher, Mr King, and say, what does ubiquitous mean? And, and of course my brothers would say, there's something wrong with Donald, what's the matter with him? He's always asking about words. So I've always been interested in words and vocabulary. I have no idea why. <laughs> They pay me, gosh, how they weigh me down. Ten cents a dance, dandies and rough guys, tough guys who tear my gown. Seven to midnight, I hear drums. Loudly the saxophone blows Trumpets are tearing my eardrums Customers crush my toes Sometimes I think I found my hero but it's a queer romance All that you need is a ticket Come on, big boy Ten cents a dance Record number three Well, record number three involves my great friend Matt Monroe, who I owe so much to 
He was one of the best singers ever to come out of this country. And the song I've chosen is a little-known Sammy Khan song from a very little-known Broadway show called Skyscraper. And it's called I'll Only Miss Her When I Think of Her. And if any would-be singers are listening, they should listen to Matt's breath control because they can then tell me if he had three lungs or not. I'll only miss her When I think of her And I'll think of her All the time Likely I'll spend my days Hearing her turn of phrase Things I found hard to praise Right now would seem sublime Cause it's still her love My heart hears Matt Munro, and I'll only miss her when I think of her. Matt Munro, whom you knew when he was still on the buses, I oh, think, Oh, yes, I knew Matt. We, we staffed together. He was on the buses and I was a struggling song plugger in, in Denmark Street. And he was just a wonderful man. I often think of Matt because if I've ever got anything that's important coming up, you know, like an interview that's, or something that, that's a bit nerve-wracking, I always think, well, what, Matt would say, oh, what does it all mean, son? <laughs> <laughs> His attitude was like that. When he was performing in Las Vegas, and I would uh, be with him, and I'd say, Matt, you know, Sinatra's out front tonight, Liberace's out front, you know. Uh, shall I bring them round for a cup of coffee or a drink? And he'd say, can't we have a game of pontoon, son? You know? And he meant it, you know, he had... <laughs> He, he was as relaxed as his voice. Was yeah, he, he, yeah, he wasn't impressed by any of the traffic. You had your first big hit with him, though, didn't you? Walk did, away. Yes. How, how did that come about? Well, it was as Matt was in the uh, Eurovision Song Contest, and uh, he loved a tune. He heard a tune called Varum Nur Varum, and um, he said to me, "You're always on about lyrics." He said, "Why don't you have a go? If Lionel Bart can do it, you can." <laughs> and that was his attitude to everything. And I took this home, and I thought. I wrote the song Walk Away and I thought, well, hang on a minute, this is very brave, Walk Away, because it's Walk Away, Please Go Before You Throw Your Life Away. It's an older man and a younger girl. And I thought, you know, is it too deep and is it too... Anyway, it came out right in the middle of all the Beatles stuff or just as that was so starting. The early 60s. Early 60s. And it was a huge hit. It was a top five hit. And uh, it was a kind of song that people noticed. John Barry, I'm pleased to say, noticed it, the composer, and asked me to do various movie Thunderball, wasn't it? Thunderball was the first one, yes. Mm. And uh, and uh, Diamonds Are Forever and uh, Born Free, and uh, Born Free was the main one. But uh, as a result of Walk Away, all kinds of doors opened for me. But before all that, just to, uh, let's back up for a second. You were an office boy at the New Musical Express. I was Express. an office boy, yes. Um, but the heart of Tin Pan Alley, that's the yes, point, isn't it? That's Denmark right. Street. It was Denmark Street. It was uh, in the eye of the storm. It was the greatest time to be anywhere. You cannot imagine it. Someone once called Denmark Street 200 yards of hokum. And I think it's just a wonderful thing because it was at the time when everyone was a songwriter down that street or a music publisher or a performer and you'd get people like Dickie Valentine who was very big Billy Eckstein from America used to come down a lot and I was surrounded by people like Tolchard Evans who wrote Lady of Spain Michael Carr who wrote South of the Border <laughs> and all these Jimmy Kennedy who wrote Red Sails in the Sunset my whole life was surrounded by songwriters I used to think well these people are professional dreamers really which is what I wanted to be just the, the idea of just walking around a park dreaming of song titles was very appealing. So that really was quite brave of you then to set out to be one of them. It was. I mean, I needed a push. I needed a hit to get me started. I needed Walk Away to, to get going and then Tom Jones with Thunderball. And all of a sudden I started getting busy because when you come from Hackney, <laughs> you feel very uncertain about uh, giving anything up, you know. So I wouldn't give up a job or anything. It took me a long time to be a fully you know, professional songwriter where I could just rely on that. Love, love, love. 
walk away, please go Before you throw your life away A life that I could share for just a day We should have met some years ago For your sake I say, walk away, just go Walk away and live A life that's full with no regret Don't look back at me Just try to forget Why build a dream That cannot come true So be strong, reach the stars now, walk away, walk on. She always runs while others walk. They are all I need to please me They can stimulate and tease me They won't leave in the night I've no fear that they might desert me Diamonds are forever Hold one up and then Press it, touch it, stroke it and undress it I can see every part, nothing hides in the heart to hurt me I don't need love, for what good will love do me? Diamonds never lie to me Next record. My next record is by a man called Jake Thackeray, who I have to say I think is one of the most unsung heroes. Uh, he is so underrated. And in the business, people think Jake Thackeray is a brilliant poet. Some people have called him a Noel Coward in, in his way. He's, he's, the words he chooses are so different uh, to anyone else. In the opening lines, it says, uh, Now we're in love, we'll have to face the la di da, the eyewash. You think, where did that come from, the eyewash? Now we're agreed that we're in love We'll have to face the la-di-da The I wash all of the fancy pantomime I love you very much I'll try love, I'll bill and coo With your gruesome auntie Susan I'll stay calm, I'll play it cool I'll let your Tetchy uncles get me back across my heart And I shan't get shirty when they say I look peculiar I'll be nice to your mother I'll come all over la da Although she always gets up me nose I love you very much 
And so I'll smile and I'll acquiesce When she invites me to caress Her scabby cat I'll sit still while she knits And witters cross my heart And I shan't lay a finger on the crabby old bat face I'll be polite to your daddy Frightfully la-ti-da Although he always bores me to my boots I love you very much Jake Thackeray and la-ti-da so, uh, Don Black, you got the Oscar for Born Free when you were about 28, but as you say, you still didn't become a full-time lyricist until you were about 36, I think. What did you do in between time? Well, in between time, I wrote a hell of a lot of songs. Uh, you've got to remember, when I won that Oscar, I, I wasn't quite sure how important that Oscar was. i never forget when I did win it. I came back after Dean Martin gave it to me, and uh, in the hotel they were all standing up applauding, and uh, it was very nice, but it was, it's not until I phoned my sister in London, and she said, well, it's, it's on the placards, the Evening Standard, it's got East End Boy Wins Oscar, you know. I didn't realise exactly what it meant. And <laughs> I was also insecure, uh, I think, even win, with that Oscar. And so, I, again, and I liked the business end of the business. And so I went in with NEMS, which was Brian Epstein's company, and I, he said I could write my songs and manage people, which I enjoyed. I was managing Matt Monroe, of course, but I was looking after people like Johnny Mathis and Nat King Cole, Andy Williams when they came here. So, again, I just like being around those sort of people. But all people who sang other people's songs. Yes. Well, of course, that is, that is the thing, and that is uh, a very good point you mentioned there, because this, when you talk about great performers, they all have one thing in common. They didn't write songs. If you look at Fred Astaire, Lena Horne, Streisand, Nat Cole, whoever your favourite, Sammy Davis Jr., they were not songwriters. They were performers and entertainers. And I think that, you know, and these days, of course, all the big stars write their own songs. It's a hell of a strain for a record company to sign somebody who doesn't write because they have to find the material for them. So if they find a singer-songwriter, it's self-contained. And it means, of course, that Tin Pan Alley, as you were describing it just now, doesn't really exist anymore, does a Tin Pan Alley, no. I mean, in those days, everyone knew everyone. You must remember, everyone knew everyone. Now, today, it wouldn't surprise me if Sting had never met Bruce Springsteen at all. You know, they don't have to meet. But there was a centre. I do miss that, uh, that feeling of togetherness. They well, say, it's also a kind of creative thing, isn't it? When, yeah. when lots of people come together who are all creative, right. somehow something else happens, whereas if they're all sitting in their millionaires' row houses yeah. doing it I, by themselves. That's why I like musicals, because it's very collaborative. Mm. And, you know, you're all together, the choreographers, directors, designers, and it's that feeling of working on something together. I mean, it's a very lonely business. Tell me about that moment, though, that, that can't be lonely, when you actually sit down with somebody, somebody you regard as great, and he or she sings your song for the first time. Well, it is thrilling. I mean, it's some things you can't put a price on. Uh, when you actually hear Barbara Streisand sing a song of yours, it's what you dream of all your life for a songwriter to have... Streisand, who's one of the greatest interpreters of, of a song. Because you persuaded her, didn't you, to record with one look from Sunset Boulevard before the show came out? Yes, I wouldn't say persuaded. I think she heard the two songs, and I went to her house in Beverly Hills and spent a whole afternoon with her, hours and hours, and we dismantled the songs together. She goes over every comma and crotchet, and she is a perfectionist, but she's a lovely, lovely lady. And in the, in the middle of it all, she's making cups of tea and talking about her life and... And when she sings, of course, I mean, uh, it's like liquid diamond. Sad heart sing with one look you'll know. 
More music. Well, I've chosen a song written by Julie Stein and Stephen Sondheim from the musical Gypsy, and uh, some of the greatest times in my life uh, has been watching Broadway shows. And uh, This song just sums up the excitement of an opening night on Broadway. It's Julie Stein at his best and Liza Minnelli giving it all she's got. Liza Minnelli singing Some People. So it was 1974, actually, Don, with the musical Billy, uh, that you became a full-time writer, and that was a great success. It ran at Drury Lane. It was based on Keith Waterhouse's Billy Lyre, as we know. It makes it all look and sound very easy. You know, you wrote a few songs and you went on and then you wrote a musical. It ain't that easy, is it, because you've had some flops as well. Tell me about your flops. Well, you haven't got time. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, well, my flops. Uh, let's talk about my flops. Right, the first flop I had was, I think, a musical called Dear Anyone, which was about an agony aunt. It starred Jane Lapater, and I wrote it with a man called Jeff Stevens, a lovely songwriter who wrote songs like Winchester Cathedral and There's a Kind of Hush All Over the World. The book was by Jack Rosenthal, and um, it wasn't terrible. And we had a big hit song from it called I'll Put You Together Again, but Hot Chocolate. But it, it was predictable. When you, when you know you're doing a musical about an agony aunt, you know going in that she can solve everybody's problems but her own. Mm -hmm. So there was a kind of, so that didn't work. I did a musical, Budgie, with Adam Faith and Anita Dobson. That didn't work. That was an unhappy experience. I thought it was a good idea, Budgie, because I thought it was Soho in the 60s, Keith Waterhouse, Adam and Anita. It just seemed right. But I'll tell you what was wrong with it, which is interesting. Uh, it seemed very old-fashioned. I think it was a bit sleazy. It was strippers, and I don't think people want that. But it's interesting, isn't it, because all the ingredients would have seemed to have been there. I mean, and, and there are many other yeah. famous flops, too, aren't there? Um, I mean, Danny Kay and Richard Rogers failed with oh, yeah. Two by I mean, Two. And yeah, but that, that's one of the great things. Alan J. Lerner, who wrote My Fair Lady, Camelot, Paint Your Wagon, he also wrote... Coco Chanel, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue about the White House, dance a little closer. I could go on about Alan's flops. And he used to just say, hey ho. Is there a recipe for success? I suppose there isn't really. You've got, to, Even if it's a small story, you've got to have a universal theme, haven't you? I think a universal theme helps a great deal. But, you, you know, Sol Hurok, the great American showman, said a wonderful thing. If people don't want to see a show, nothing will stop them. <laughs> And I think that's so true. Uh, you can't make people go to a theatre. It's word of mouth at the end of the day. It happens. Is it? But, I mean, you've, you've got to have, as we say, this universal theme, you've got to have a good story, a good book, even mm. if it's yes. sung through or whatever. Have yes. you got to have big stars? You certainly don't need big stars because Phantom of the Opera is packing them in all the time and no-one knows who's in it when they buy their ticket. They go mm. to see Phantom, not the person in it. And it's the same with, with Evita and Les Mis. People go to Les Mis. And it's interesting with shows like Les Mis and Miss Saigon because these are shows that don't really have hit songs in them either, which is unusual because Richard Rogers always used to talk about take-home songs. But I once interviewed the writers of Les Mis and, and Miss Saigon and they said, well, they, they take home shows, they don't take home songs. But what it all proves is it's, it's a completely unpredictable business. You've just got to keep trying and it's trying again. It's very difficult. I once compared it with doing your own root canal work. <laughs> it, is that, it is that difficult. That painful? That painful, yes. Record number six. Uh, well, this song is a lovely song written by a man called Mac Gordon. You'd know uh, many of his other songs, like The More I See You. He's written some wonderful songs. But uh, this song is lovely because it's an unusual story. It's about a, a woman who's in love with someone she shouldn't be in love with. It's called My Heart Tells Me. My heart tells me 
cry again. Lips that kiss like yours will lie again. If I'm fool enough to see this through, will I be sorry if I do? Should I? Susanna McCorkle and My Heart Tells Me. Can I ask you the impossible question? Which, which piece that you've written are you proudest of? Or is there one line or a whole song? It's always a very difficult thing. I like odd bits and pieces. There's a song I wrote for Michael Jackson called Ben. I like the middle section of that, which Michael Jackson liked the best, because it says it in as few words as you can. And it says, um, I used to say I and me, now it's us, now it's we, which says a lot in, in the, as few notes as, as possible. I used to say Seven. Record number seven, yes. Now, I love country music, and um, because as opposed to the lyric writing that goes on in Broadway, which is all to do with polished lyrics, it's very unpolished there. It's all about raw emotion. And I spent some time in Nashville, and everyone is looking for titles. Everyone's a songwriter down in Nashville. If you say hello to them, they say, hey, what a great title. <laughs> you know. But I'd like to you know, have been there when this guy wrote this title, because I think it really is a terrific one. You picked a fine time to leave me, Lucille. In a bar in Toledo, across from the depot, on a bar stool, she took off a ring. I thought I'd be closer, so I walked on over. I sat down and asked her her name When the drinks finally hit her She said I'm no quitter But I finally quit living on dreams I'm hungry for laughter And here ever after I'm after whatever the other life brings In the mirror I saw him I closely watched him I thought how he looked out of place He came to the woman Who sat there beside me He had a strange look on his face Now his big hands were calloused He looked like a mountain For a minute I thought I was dead But he started shaking his big heart was breaking And he turned to the woman and said You picked a fine time to leave me, Lucille With four hungry children and crops in the field I've had some bad times, lived through some sad times But 
This time the hurting won't heal He picked the fire time to leave me Lucille Kenny Rogers and Lucille. Tell me about Don Black on a Desert Island. Um, there must be inspiration for a few songs there. Well, I don't know. I'd probably things like Yellow Bird Up High in Banana Tree or something like that. But uh, sort of girl from Ipanema or something. Yes. I mean, you could imagine. I could imagine all that. I don't funny enough, I can. I I've taught myself to write anywhere, in kitchens on streets and but it doesn't matter where I write because it's all in your head, it's that mind wandering lunacy. So I don't think it matters where you are. I don't think I'd be great on this desert island. So I mean it sounds marvellous, but I'm not very good as a handyman. I'm not very good as a cook. Um, I don't think I'd be a great survivor there. I mean, I'd love it for a few hours. I love the idea of it. But are you a great reflector? I mean, would you would you sit there and I don't know, reflect on the nature of your success or? Well, they say it is always nice to reflect on your achievements instead of looking ahead about what may happen. It's a thing people should do, you know. And I think that is nice because I think everyone tries very hard and they never stop to. Look what's happened so far. I think you enjoy it. I've always loved writing songs. I would never stop. If I won the lottery, it wouldn't make any difference. I'd still be writing songs. How often do you write one? I write masks, but I'm often scribbling down ideas. I have books full of thoughts, thinking, oh, well, that's a good idea. One day that that will come in handy. Next record. It's a duet from uh, The Pearl Fishers by Bizet. The reason I chose this is that some songs and some music is written, but this one seems to be coming from the gods. It seems to be coming from some exalted arena. And it just, just takes you to the sky. Nous avons vécu séparés l'un de l'autre. Brahma nous réunit, que la joie est la nôtre. Mais parle, et tu restes fidèle à ton serment, et ce ami que je revois, ou bien notre traître.
So, Don, if you could only take one of those eight records... I would take the Albanoni Adagio because it would keep me busy and I'll just keep writing words. <laughs> and a book? I've chosen a, a book that probably no one's heard of. It's, uh, I, I picked it up in America. It's called 14,000 Things to be Happy About and it's written by a lady called Barbara Ann Kipfer. And it's just a list, really, and it's a reminder of the small pleasures in life we all take for granted. Things like a trip to the library, uh, the cool underside of a pillow, crayons for children in restaurants, W.C. Fields, The Wizard of Oz, window boxes, just little things like that that would uh, remind me of life back wherever. Keep you happy. I think you are just a happy person, aren't you? I don't know whether you need to be kept happy. I like to think I have a sunny disposition. I'm not really aware of it until I look at other people and I think, well, other compared to other people... Well, this <laughs> I think how miserable <laughs> they are. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> what about your luxury? Well, I've always been a great snooker enthusiast, so I would have a, a snooker table. And whenever I play snooker for a couple of hours, it just I forget about everything. Just how do I get that white ball back here? You know, it's just a... Another small pleasure. What about, uh, what about? Let me just ask you finally uh, about your parents. I mean, we were saying that your mother was so starstruck. Did she live to enjoy your success for itself? Well, well she did to a certain extent. She was there for a few of them, but unfortunately, she died just before my Oscar, which I thought was a terrible, terrible tragedy. But uh, she was there, and just the fact that I knew people like Matt Monroe, who she heard on the radio, she was happy. It, it, you know, she she didn't have to meet Sinatra. She was quite happy to meet the fella down the road who who sang in the local pub. She was quite happy to meet anyone who was just just involved in this magical business. <laughs> As free as the wind blows As free as the grass grows Born free to follow your heart Live free And beauty surrounds you The world still astounds you it's time you look at a star Stay free Where no walls divide you You're free as a roaring tide So there's no need to But only worth living Cause you're born free
Somehow I feel your love is real Near you I want to be The birds are singing, it is song time The band is running soft and low I know that you yearn for me too Swanee, you're calling me Swanee, how I love you, how I love you, my dear old Swanee I give the world to be among the folks in D.I.X. I even know my mammy is waiting for me, praying for me down by the Swanee. The folks up north will see me no more when I get to that Swanee shore. I love the old folks at home. Swanee, how I love you, how I love you, my dear old Swanee. I give the world to be among the folks in P.I.X. I even know my mammy is waiting for me, praying for me down by the Swanee. The folks up north will see me no more when I get to that Swanee. So Don Black, thank you very much indeed for letting us hear your Desert Island Discs.